Hi, everyone. I am Laura Kurgan, and I wear many hats um, at, the, at, at GSAC. Um, I'm a professor of architecture. Um, I'm director of the Center for Spatial Research, which I'm going to be talking about today. Our current work, some projects in process, um, and also some finished work. And I'm also the um, director of the visual study sequence, which somewhat feeds in um, to the work we do in the, in the center as well. Um, but before I start, I'd actually, I'd love to get a sense of who you are. So maybe just um, if you can put into the chat whether you're um, an incoming student, your name, um, or whether you're a current student, whether you're a, simply a person of the public, um, I would love to just get a sense of uh, who is here. So how about if I give you just two minutes, um, because it'll also help me. I'm not reading a presentation today. It'll really help me frame a little bit how I approach um, showing the work. All right, so this is really fantastic. And um, I'm looking at the list of students. And it really is in the spirit of um, how we think of ourselves in the center um, as, a, as something which bridges between uh, architecture, urban planning, urban design, the advanced program um, in architecture. And further than that, we are actually a hub um, of spatial research between the humanities and also make bridges to data science. And the grant that helped to establish us um, also helped to ensure that we could make those kinds of connections. Um, and so I will switch to the slides um, so that I can start with the actual presentation. Okay, so this probably means I'm going to become just a little speaking head um, and start the um, and start the presentation. Okay, and thank you all for coming and I'm really happy to see some incoming students, continuing students, um, and former students, it appears as well. So I got a few messages from them. So, oops, okay. Before I even start, I want to want to say that all the work that I show here is number one, seriously collaborative and collaborative across disciplines. Um, we work with the history department, we work with data science, English, um, the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, the Center for the Study of Social Difference, um, the Institute of Comparative Literature and Society. We've done team courses with all of those people and really cross, try to cross the university. And more importantly, within the lab, um, we have an amazing uh, team right now, and Dara Brawley, who has just graduated from urban planning this past year, is the assistant director of the center. Jia Zhang is an associate research scholar, and she, this is her uh, second year doing that, third year. Dan Miller um, is a, also a research associate and particularly working on the historical New York City project. I'm going to show you a little bit of that as we move forward. Um, we have some current students who are working with us, Adeline Chum, who's in the MRH program, Audrey Dandino, also um, in the MRH program, Nadine Fatale in the CCCC program, Tola Onayangi has just graduated. She worked with us for three years and um, was the GIS TA um, and worked as a research assistant on many of our projects. And this summer, we have um, a large team as well. Um, Adeline Chum again, um, Nelson De Jesus, he's a MRH student, Nadine, who's a CCCP student, Spencer, who's an MRH student, and same with Adam. Um, so we do a large range of projects, as I, I talked about, and these are the kinds of themes that we always address. So although we are a data center and a data analytics center, we approach our work from a humanities point of view, which means that we ask really difficult questions about the data that we use. We don't take anything as given. We don't think of anything without the history of where something originates. 
Um, and we have many audiences for our work from policy arena to museum exhibitions to public facing websites to things that we are just actually doing for an archive so that it becomes a resource for future academics um, and activists. So all kinds of things really um, thinking of mapping as the medium through which we do our work and mapping as the way that we question both the history of cities and the future of cities. Um, our most famous project, which I'm not going to talk about today, but if anybody in this group wants me to give a longer lecture about how this project unfolded and where it's going now, because we're going, especially in the context of um, Black Lives Matter, um, it has become uh, an important sort of uh, touching touch touchstone for um, for a lot of different disciplines, even especially at Columbia. And this was a project which um, addressed mass incarceration. And instead of making maps of crime, uh, and maps of crime are ones which uh, really address the police, they uh, they are there to encourage police to come to a certain part of the city and solve for something. We instead mapped incarceration, which showed where people who are currently housed in prison, uh, what their home address was. And it was a completely different approach, which, in, which instead says, how much uh, does it cost to community and to the city to incarcerate people um, from mostly poorer communities of color, rather than um, invest in those communities and think about alternatives to incarceration, think about how we can prevent the prison to the school to prison pipeline and other ways of uh, what we're calling nowadays the politics of care. And I'll show you a little bit more about that project as we, as we proceed. So there's a lot about this project on the website. You can download PDFs. It's a chapter of my book. And it's really been a constant project in the center. So, um, but what I wanna do today um, is I'm going to show um, two projects, um, which are about the urban origins of specific algorithms which have um, a huge impact on the way our networks are designed and the, the architecture of our networks. So, you know, um, just a little paragraph that describes this, whether it is online or in our daily physical routines, we interact with others, close friends, acquaintances, familiar and unfamiliar strangers in ways that over time come to show patterns. Um, network theory represents these relationships as graphs using a visual language of ties and lines connecting nodes and circles to describe the topography and dynamics of families, friendships, groups, workplaces, neighborhoods, and communities. By representing complex systems as graphs, network science also allows us to link macro and micro phenomena to understand how ideas and things are transmitted and disseminated how they travel and spread. But what exactly are these ties and how do they matter? How does the framework of network analysis synthesize, represent, and evaluate them? So to do this work, we, um, we took on the, um, the papers of two prominent um, sociolo sociologists, three actually prominent sociologists. The first paper is called Friendship as a Social Process. And it was written by uh, Paul Lazarsfeld and Robert Merton. And Robert Merton was a sociologist, longtime sociologist at Columbia. And we had access to a huge archive um, at the, in, at, in Butler Library about this work. And the second one um, is a paper by Mark Granovetter. Called, and this, the first paper was written in 1954. The second one in 1973 by Mark Granovetter uh, called the, um, the strength of weak ties. And both of them based their research in, uh, in you know, utopian, so-called utopian housing projects of the 50s, where uh, it was a federal program to desegregate um, housing. Um, and then the second paper was grounded in, um, in the 70s, where in urban renewal 
uh, programs which demolish these very same housing projects. So that's kind of where we started. And then also just to remind you that my own history, um, you know, I began using the internet like most other people in a hugely optimistic way where there were things like the independence of declaration of independence of cyberspace, right, in the early 90s governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel. I come from cyberspace, the new home of my mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you, you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among, among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. You will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the world your governments have made before, right? So it was a direct rejection of the government in favor of, uh, private networks, and it was supposed to be a utopian one. Everybody was included, except, uh, you know, there was even this idea that there was no race, no gender, no disabilities, right? That here, there are only minds, we can only think of utopia. So I think we've learned by now that this was a mistake, you know, there's in fact, uh, over this long history, there was very little Africa on the internet. And what we have come to understand is the deep polarization that is happening in our social networks. And this uh, research that we're doing on the urban history of algorithms tries to uh, take on this, this history, um, you know, so that we, we can open up the black box of the algorithms that are really actually directing our social lives. And because our social lives online are so deeply tied to physical space nowadays, we really have to understand the origin of some of these ideas. So again, this project was done with a large team. I'm as a principal investigator, Dara Brawley, Brian House was a, um, a research associate two years ago, Jia Zhang and Wendy Chun, um, who was teaching at Brown at the time, and now she runs a research center at Simon Fraser University in, in, uh, in Vancouver, and we're still working with her um, on, this, on this project. So we start by saying um, that these two sociologists actually coined the word homophily. And you know, if I was in a classroom right now, I would ask you how many people have even heard of the word homophily. If you have taken computer science, you likely have heard the word. Um, if not, you know, if you've never studied network science, that's very likely you, you don't understand this very important concept, which really, uh, has a, a, a huge influence over our networked lives. Um, so to coin this word, um, homophily, Lazarsfeld and Merton asked themselves the question, uh, do birds of a feather flock together, right? Does similarity breed connection? And importantly, they asked this as a question. And to answer that question, they decided to interview residents um, of this housing project, uh, which is in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and although this was a desegregated um, housing project, black and white people lived in different buildings. So in, uh, in the white squares, the white residents live and in the hatch squares, the black residents live. Um, and this is an aerial photograph. Um, and these are some photographs by a famous photographer, uh, Charles Teeny Harris. And you can see even the photographs have mostly black people or mostly white people in the frames, depending on which housing uh, they, um, they were photographing. Very rarely, uh, like this image on the left, were the residents commingled. Um, okay, so, to do their research, they asked, they asked a lot of questions, 90 questions, in fact. But to come up with their definition of what, uh, what homophily is, they asked that they, they um, limited the survey results, the tabulation of the surveys, to two questions. Do you think white and colored people should live together in housing projects? Yes or no? Or 26, on the whole, do you think that white and colored um, 
that colored and white in the village get along pretty well or not so well, right? Get along pretty well, don't get along so well. So all the respondents in the survey, there were 518 people. That was 100% of the population. Um, and as you can see, um, the results were, uh, you know, tabulated as liberal, ambivalent, they didn't know whether what they thought, or illiberal, they didn't like living with black people or black people didn't like living with white people, right? Um, so that's how they tabulated their results. And then um, they tried to uh, account um, for the opposite, right? We must here confine, uh, so um, our inquiry to white residents, since there are too few illiberal or ambivalent Negroes, this is their word, uh, so black people, with friends in Hilltown to allow comparative analysis. Further detailed statistics will be found in the patterns of social life. Selected summaries of these statistics are sufficient for the present purposes, right? So, um, and this is what we, we found in the, in, the, um, in the archive. We were going back to try and figure out how they made these decisions, right? So they also had to go through this process of saying who their three closest friends were um, and where do each of them live and you know, friendships were not defined as family. They were defined as, you know, not, um, not, part of, not part of your family. So this, again, further biased this survey, right? But then we found this astonishing little scribbled upon sketch. In fact, Wendy Chun found it when she once came to visit us um, in the library and it really started the collaboration. Um, and what they were showing were Hilltown whites versus Hilltown blacks. And they were showing, right, that black people had no problem living with white people, but that white people showed what they called an overselection, right? There were 31% of white people in the population of the housing projects, and 45% of them were considered liberal, which meant they wanted to live with black people. Um, and they, you know, they kept going with this, with this observation of overselection. And overselection is something that you need to make a statistical point, right? And there was no overselection in the black population. In fact, there was an underselection, right? So moving forward from here, they um, they ignored the surveys of the black residents in order to define the word homophily. And then not only that, they wanted to try and define the opposite hom homophily, right? Which is heterophily, right? So, um, right, so I, I, I hope you can understand how, where this is, where this is moving, right? So to, under, to define homophily, um, which started as a question, do birds of a feather flock together? They only um, counted the survey results of white people in that population. So what effect did that have? Um, so I'm going to show over here how uh, our team thought that these effects played out when they were applied to social networks like Facebook, for example, right? So when Merton, uh, West and Jehoda developed the survey questionnaire for the residents of As Addison Terrace, they asked respondents to name their three closest friends, excluding family members and colleagues, casual acquaintances and neighbors. While this limited view of society made their subsequent analysis possible, it fell short of representing the many ways that people share information and develop values within a community, right? So then we made a, a big jump, right? And I was showing you before that graph theory, you know, networks are defined with points uh, as nodes and lines which connect them. So if you start with a network that has, uh, and this is about the design of a network now, if you start with a network that has a 67% tolerance level, right, which means you are liberal and you're willing to make connections with people who are not like you. Um, and if you start adding nodes to that network, right, your network will stay uh, 
diverse. It'll stay mixed. It'll stay, you know, with people of lots of opinions. But, but if you design your network with a 33% Tara Lawrence, right, you can see in the, it'll start polarizing a little bit. With 10% tolerance, it polarizes even more. So on Facebook, um, they have this algorithm called triadic closure, which allows you to make friends, you know, with, with other people. If there is that 67% tolerance on Facebook, to you as well, your network would stay more diverse. Okay, now I just want to say we're guessing over here. We don't have Facebook algorithms. You cannot unpack that black box. But this is network theory, and so we've taken it in a theoretical level. So because on Facebook, the tolerance is likely designed to be 10% because in fact, the financial model of Facebook is that advertising is directed particularly to you based on how you click on things and say what you like and you don't like, right? So to make that model effective, the tolerance in Facebook is much, is much less, right? So if you start with a tolerance of 10%, your network will become further and further and further polarized. And that was the basic of, of, of this research is trying to, to demonstrate that um, homophily was in fact, when, when the researchers were defining it, posed as a question, became naturalized and an axiom in the world of network science, right? And so we tried to show this by an unpublished version of the paper versus the published version of the paper where they were much more open-ended in their questions of, um, of what homophily was. You know, they say observed as a dominant pattern, but you know, in the, in the longer paper, it's a descriptive concept, a process rather than an observation. It's misleading without indicating the nature of the social context, right? So it's a much more complex um, topic, which got simplified by network science. And then we undertook an analysis of, um, of how homophily uh, was, was cited over time. And the paper was written in 1954. And you can see it's only in the year sort of 2000, 2005, even 2010, right, that it really starts being cited. And it's mostly being cited by um, computer science, social science, you know, all these all these different fields who are grappling with online networks okay and then we've done some other this is just a fun thing showing the context of the use of the word in the sent in the abstract sentence of the society, of the article that's quoting it so what this did was it ignored the ambiguity um, of the initial question of the of the term and this is Lazar's this is Lazar's felt um, it's another archival image because he ran an, a media center and a radio network where in the background of there, you can see this like, this like button. So it was the first kind of radio survey where they would ask participants, if you like uh, this program, press the button. If you don't like it, press the button. And they had these kind of user groups. So in fact, it was in some ways the history of that like button, which is causing such incredible problems on, um, on social on social media and then we took this further um, to looking at the work of an economist named um, Schelling um, who used the who used homophily um, to create an, uh, an algorithm of sorts but it was a game that he played with students and presuming homophily right and this was about neighborhoods and it was about white flight from cities he said, because of homophily, you want to live near neighbors who are like yourself, right? So they had this whole game. It was actually, they played it with pennies and dimes. But the idea was, you know, if this purple point over here is not next to three purple, you know, three crosses, it's going to be unhappy and it's going to move itself. And it's going to keep moving and keep moving and keep moving until it's surrounded by four neighbors that are like it. Um, and this was a model to, which was predictive of, um, uh, 
the way uh, residents organize themselves in suburban communities. So I'll show you the Chicago, the Chicago Architecture Biennale version of this project a little later when I talk about um, when I talk about the exhibits. But what we did um, was we ended that article asking the question: you know, would um, if they had taken the the answers of the black residents into account, would there have been more heterophily? And would that concept have been defined differently, right? And then as we moved further, we realized that actually heterophily is not the opposite of homophily. And we started researching um, this concept of weak ties, um, which was a paper written by Mark Granovetter in the 70s. And to do his research, right, so it, it, it starts from a tie between two people um, and then um, talking about, you know, the time and the intimacy of that relationship and the emotional intensity and the way people exchange things between one another results in the strength of a tie. But then when you have multiple friends joining together, you know, you're trying to look at uh, whether there's a strong overlap between two groups by the amount of friends that people have in common between those two groups, right? And then you realize that if there is a strong density of friendships, like this one over here, where, uh, where people are, you know, all tied together in a strong density, versus the 67% density uh, images where there's two, two friends are connected together, but the, the third friends are not connected together, then, you know, that shows different degrees of density and how intense the overlaps of these network um, really have an effect on, on community. So, you know, that's why we call it sort of micro connections between two people and how it results in macro phenomena, how communities end up interacting uh, with each other and particularly in, in cities. Right, so we've done all these different studies of how ideas travel across networks. This is very much a uh, work in pro progress. And um, Granovetter defines this term a bridging tie, where you have two groups of strong networks. And if two, of those, if two or more of those people connect with each other, you have that bridge between two different communities which joins them, which joins them together. So the way that Granovetter did this work is he, connect, he quoted um, a study, and for those of you who might have done uh, architecture or urbanism in your undergraduates, a book by Herbert Gans called The Urban Villagers. And Herbert Gans caught wind of um, urban renewal of the West End of Boston and before it was demolished, he went as an ethnographer and studied the lives of these people. And he took photographs like this, and uh, the people he studied were mostly Italian uh, immigrants who had lived in the United States maybe two or three generations. Um, you know, very tight knit uh, communities um, on small blocks but this was not a very affluent um, community. Um, and what we started asking um, was, you know, how, um, so what Granovetter started asking was how that study by Gans um, resulted, um, or how those networks between the people in that neighborhood, which had been defined by urban, the Urban Renewal Project as an obsolete neighborhood, right? Of no use anymore. Uh, the, you know, the space, the air flow between the blocks was bad and, you know, all kinds of crazy reasons which would not hold muster today. Um, and proposed a new plan um, for this area. And it was very close to downtown and a new commercial um, district was being formed. And this area was um, 
demolished right here, showing that advantage of the central location of the West End in Boston, which made it a prime lo location for urban renewal. Right? And then they did all these studies about the conditions of the dwellings that was highly biased towards their demolition, you know, talking about things like lack of air or um, you know, the age of the building, um, nothing to do with the strong communities that were living in these neighborhoods. So the important point over here was that Gans was studying these smaller units, right, these peer groups, um, and Granovetter, using his research, decided that there were not enough strong ties between the different peer groups to be able to succeed against the demolition of this really large neighborhood. Um, and what, we, what we're showing is that the urban renewal plan itself looked at all these multiple peer groups and saw them as one unified neighborhood. Now, Gans um, would never have agreed that, you know, they, they was, that this was a neighborhood at all. It was just a, a group of smaller community blocks and neighborhoods which associated together but didn't think of themselves as a neighborhood and was only the aerial view of the urban renewal program which defined it as a neighborhood until then it didn't even have a name and this resulted in the demolition um, of this neighborhood so um, in a in a very vibrant uh, dialogue back and forth between Granovetter and Gans, they were arguing about why this neighborhood um, ended up being demolished, um, and you know it goes back again to the to the assembly of networks and to the formalization of the network and how they operate um, between each other. And what we've decided um, as a team is that actually, although this neighborhood was demolished um, and that Granovetter was right about the weakness of the strength of the weak ties um, which allowed this which disallowed this community from uh, mobilizing politically and becoming activists to stop the demo stop the bulldozers um, were there uh, leaders who could have activated um, the networks to join together, perhaps there could have been a different outcome. And many articles which, uh, which quote this Granovetter article, which cite it, uh, talk about activation, activation networks between the weak ties. Um, and so we've come to believe and we're putting a paper together um, about how to activate weak ties in social networks so that um, you can foster networks that are not homophilous, right? And, you know, those are the networks that wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, be the ones that are linked to advertising as, you know, for making money for networks, but might require us to design and form new social networks, new ways of mediating between online and offline platforms so that we can actually encourage difference and encourage uh, multiplicity of types of communities, um, et cetera. Okay, so that's where we are with the urban history of algorithms. Um, I'm going to move quickly to uh, mapping the politics of care, which is a project that we're going to launch very quickly um, within the next five days. So consider yourself seeing a, a preview of this. And it's something that we're working on um, faculty and students and staff of the Department of Epidemiology and Microbial Diseases um, at Yale School of Public Health and um, the Center for Spatial Research. Um, and the reason that we're doing this is that we read an article by Greg Gonsalves and Amy Kapczynski, um, who have initiated um, this project talking about what they're calling the new politics of care. So um, one which is organized around a commitment to universal provision for human needs, countervailing power for workers, people of color, and the vulnerable, and a rejection of carceral approaches to social problems. The question now is how to connect that vision to programmatic responses that address the needs of the moment and beyond. 
We need to aim at non-reformist reforms, reforms that embody a vision of a different world that we want, and, and that work from a theory of power building that recognizes that real change requires changing who has a say in our political process, right? So it's very connected to the network um, analysis, but their goal, their goal, their goal is to, is to create which is one place to start to build a new movement that heals us and our body politic and will allow us, all of us, to survive a pandemic and then to thrive. So what we did was um, we started um, with what is called a social vulnerability index, which, um, which we've underlaid on our map as a way of biasing and actively biasing how um, the, the COVID data is read and what to do about it, right? So what the social vulnerability index does is says that every community must prepare for and respond to hazardous events, whether a natural disaster like a tornado or a disease outbreak or an anthropogenic event such as a harmful chemical spill. The degree to which community exhibits certain social conditions, including high poverty, low percentage of vehicle access, overcrowded households may affect that community's ability to prevent human suffering and a financial loss in the event of a disaster. These factors describe a community's social vulnerability, right? So it's, it's defined by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and it's called the Social Vulnerability Index, right? So using this as a background, um, uh, the project is um, to make a map which helps public health workers, help public health officials decide um, how to measure the need for community health workers and how to assign them, right? So there has been this decision that, um, uh, that oh goodness, this is in the wrong place. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, there has been a decision, a decision in many states that caseworkers will be assigned to do contact tracing, right, to figure out who had um, COVID and how it has been spread. This group that I'm working with is very um, opposed to cell phone tracking um, and does it in the old style uh, public health model of making phone calls, making house visits, um, et cetera. So you can see here, our map will show the number of case of COVID cases, right? We'll also have a tab um, which shows new cases as the percent of the population, right? So this, if you've done GIS, it shows the hotspots, it shows, and, and this map will always be um, within two weeks up to date. Um, the third one shows the, the SVI, and then the fourth one shows SVI in relation to hotspot analysis, right? So then the second part of the legend is how do we want to measure the need for community health workers and how many community health workers can your county, state, whatever it is, pay for, right? And the agreed upon number is 30 community health workers, 400,000 residents. So over here, you can see this is the number of COVID cases and what would happen if you had 50 caseworkers, you know, if you could afford 50 caseworkers per 100,000 people. And it's showing you in those two weeks where the need is, okay? When we launch the project, it'll be up to date. So this is the same thing, new cases as percent of the population and here 30 caseworkers are assigned and it's telling you what we think are the counties that are most in need of caseworkers and we've prioritized that by social vulnerability, right? So it's not to say that if we're in New York and there's people on the Upper East Side who have COVID and we should attend to them. But what we're trying to show is that Elmhurst, Queens is more in need of caseworkers at a particular, at a particular no moment in time based on their vulnerability to the illness. So it has a political point of view, which is every single map that is drawn has an argument, has a community point of view, and we strongly believe that as a mode of research that we do. Um, oops, okay, so 
Um, and then this shows when you zoom in, you can see the weightedness. It gives you um, information. It's for a more um, educated user in you know, how you should assign various cases. Oops, okay. And that moves forward. Okay, so that project will be launched next week. Um, this is another project which is very, very much work in process, um, but I've, I've never shown it before and I'm really excited because we've actually made quite a lot of headway with it. It's mapping historical New York. The PI is on the project uh, myself. Me Nye, who is a history professor, uh, history historian of immigration, Rebecca Cobrin, um, Gergo Beitsch, who's at Barnard, um, who both of them are also historians, um, uh, urban historians. Uh, Leah Meisterlin in urban planning is also um, an advisor to the project and she's done a lot of work with Gergo Beitsch with a previous version of some data like this. Um, so what we have um, is, you know, we've taken um, the census from some historic years, 1850, 1880, and 1910. At the moment, we're only working on Manhattan and Brooklyn, but hopefully we will have our funding renewed to include the Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island. Um, and to do this, we have taken uh, three different atlases, which have previously been digitized by the New York Public Library, and the Brooklyn Historical Society, and we have uh, patchworked them together as the underlays for our maps. So when you zoom in, you can see this is the this is the digitized historical work that is underlaying this map. From that, we are creating this uh, digital street street grid, which has not been drawn before in this particular way. And so now you can see that that's the streets in Manhattan and Brooklyn in 1850. Um, oops. In 1880 and in 1910, where by 1910 you can see there's a complete street, street grid. The other thing we're doing is we're taking um, a handwritten census, which was um, typed up by uh, the Mormon church, actually, and made accessible to public researchers and then have taken that historical census and tabulated it so that it can be like any, any GIS file where if you have um, a name, an address, um, you can put a dot on a map, right? And so here is the, you know, like 400, 400 to 500,000 people who lived in New York in, in 1880 and the same amount of people in Brooklyn. Um, over here, you can see a dot where a person has been counted for each household. And over here is a really nice um, uh, rendition of their occupation. So clerk, builder, dentist, plumber, money broker, coffee and tea agent, congressional, congregational minister, just all kinds of painting manufacturers. So it's a really incredibly detailed portrait. And in this map over here, um, the census at this time actually asked your country of origin. And so blue is people from England, red is people from Ireland, green is people from Germany. So really what we're showing here in some ways is the history of, uh, of of whiteness, of white New York, and how um, immigrants moved here on the one hand, were part of the colonization um, that had occurred a century before. The Manhattan grid was laid out in, in 1811, but never before has this kind of analysis happened um, at, this incredible, at this incredibly detailed um, scale. So here is a map of, of Brooklyn. Manhattan has been, uh, this is actually the first time such a detailed uh, historical map of Brooklyn has been drawn. And, um, and this one is particularly interesting um, because it's about uh, an area maybe a lot of you know from uh, a Flatbush in 1850 and it shows farm lines and roads that are digitized by a project. The edge of the city of Brooklyn's grid is to the north at the top, at the top of the image. Um, and here, 
are the streets that we've digitized from 1850 to 1910 to neighborhood uh, to the neighborhood level. It's subdivided and gridded, urbanized already, and consolidated into the fold into the borough of Brooklyn as it became part of New York City. Right, Brooklyn up until this point wasn't part of New York City. Um, a gridded system of roads and property lines is implemented, and so what we'll also be able to show is how the property uh, leases changed hands, etc. Um, and so here is just showing the influence of those uh, county roads and farm lines, which can still be seen in the form of Brooklyn's grid and how they sort of uh, collide with one another. Okay, so that's that. Um, and I don't know, how much time do we have, Lila? Uh, I, as much as you need, I would, I would encourage you to just go through the presentation yeah. at your pace. Presentation. Okay. I'm just going to very quickly show you some more finished um, projects because those ones are, uh, I really wanted to show you work in progress and how we do all of our work. Um, so this is um, a couple of uh, projects that ended up in biennales and I thought it's a good way to show some finished work. So. We ran a big project um, in the center called Conflict Urbanism Aleppo, and we were tracking um, the war uh, as it happened and made one of the few um, interactive maps, which number one, uh, located the names of uh, neighborhoods in Aleppo. We based it on an open street maps uh, map and, um, why is it doing this? Um, and then on the other hand, because there was a war going on and we couldn't go uh, and visit um, Aleppo, obviously, we, um, we used YouTube video and a lot of activist channels of YouTube video to begin to uh, understand and analyze what was going on um, in Aleppo. And, and through this have actually created an archive that, is, that exists now that anybody who wants to study Aleppo can look at um, you know, a specific neighborhood and know in this neighborhood there were eight, 184 videos and you can go and look at them and they're uh, organized by date. And the reason that we could do this is, you know, during a seminar that I was teaching because we had uh, actually Madea Merchant had made the map of neighborhood names. And some people in the seminar, including Nadine Fatale, who is uh, working in the, in the center now, and Violet Whitney, who's teaching in visual studies, collaborated with Nadine's Arabic knowledge and uh, Violet's programming uh, uh, facility to put this map together um, so that it exists forever um, as an archive. The other thing that we were doing is we were tracking um, urban damage and for this we were using data that was uh, generated by UNHCR um, which showed all the, the damage through pouring of uh, um, satellite images. Um, if you don't know much about Aleppo, for most of the war the city was divided between the government held west and the so-called rebel controlled east and as the war proceeded um, there, there were fights over um, infrastructures, particular highways, uh, water access, electricity, et cetera, um, which in the end, the government succeeded in creating a siege in Eastern Aleppo. Um, and what you see over here is the damage in the informal parts of the city, which were over 60% of the damage in the city. And we've written a paper to, to show that these informal parts of the city had become part of a planning process prior to the war where the Assad regime had wanted to get rid of these neighborhoods um, in the first place. So we ask a lot of questions about infrastructure and war and more and more war are being, wars are being fought within the within the boundaries and within the domestic spaces of cities. Oops. Okay, so there's a number of case studies on the website which you should all look at. 
um, at the Biennale, we were very excited to be um, have this exhibit location in the Museum of Archaeology. And within the museum, there was actually an actual piece, a stillas, from the citadel of Aleppo. And then we thematically sort of themed the whole exhibit around this, um, this column that was in the museum. Um, also at the, at the Istanbul Biennale, we did a much more abstract exhibition. Uh, we were collaborating with the, the newly formed um, Suckerman Institute Mind Brain Behavior Center. And we called it One Brain, 100 Billion Neurons, 100 tr Trillion Connections. Um, uh, some architecture students worked with uh, neuroscientists to take their connectome model, which is like each of us have a very unique structure in our brain, which networks ourselves and our memories together. So it's a newly formed network model of the brain as, a supposed, as opposed to a spatial model of the brain, which says, you know, your memory is here, your mobility is here. It all is networked together. And it's also part of um, this idea that we all have very deep memories, um, which we don't know how. The brain is the messiest part of our body. Um, scientists still don't understand it. Um, there's many people talking right now about, you know, the generations of memory that are constructed within us um, and networked um, into, into our brain. So although this is, you know, um, a more aesthetic um, exhibit, it's part of an ongoing research that we're doing about network network culture and network society. And I'm, I'm trying to um, in, uh, use this to write a future article about the image of uh, Kevin Lynch's book, The Image of the City, which was based on neuroscience principles of the 70s and cognitive uh, science and cognitive mapping. I'm trying to link it to a new body of research, which is about, uh, you know, where Lynch was talking about place cells. Uh, new scientists are talking about grid cells. And I'm trying to link these two things together as they're called the GPS for the brain. And I'm trying to understand that in terms of, in terms of network society. And these were laser printed models of very intricate neurons, um, which are not things that have been 3D rendered um, in physical space very often, right? So this is giant, huge magnification of, uh, of uh, the molecules that are in your brain, which are called neurons. Um, another project that was displayed at um, the Oslo Triennale, uh, this was uh, led up by Juan Saldariaga, who's from Colombia, and we were looking at um, the victim's registry, which, um, which took the swath of the civil war in Colombia from the 70s to now. And um, the database itself is created by the government to think about reparations to its citizens, especially if they were forcibly moved from one part of their country to another. Um, but what we saw in this database was an amazing opportunity to show urban rural migration, urban urban migration in a country over um, a 50 year period because the where they came from and where they moved to was written into the database. So you hear this so much as a cliche um, nowadays that there's urban rural migration, but it's very, very, very hard to map. And um, this was because of this amazing database, however uncertain and incomplete and imperfect it is, it allowed us to uh, create this picture. And you can look at this further on our website. Um, and then this is the last project that I'll show, and it was for the last Biennale um, in 2018. We collaborated with Diller and Scafidia and Renfro and Robert Pietrusco, Richard Pietrusco teaches at Harvard. Um, and we were assigned um, the global scale. Um, it was a, a show called Dimensions of Citizenship, and it started from the individual scale to the group, to the neighborhood scale, to the, I don't know, the, the territorial scale, it's all on the, on the website, and to the planetary scale, to the network scale. Everybody, each team had a different um, assignment. 
and we were given the global scale. And to do this, we looked at, um, I'll just show you this, how we unroll the map. I just love that part. It didn't have much conceptual weight, but it does show how difficult it is to go from a 3D version of a globe to a 2D version of a globe. Um, so what we did was we took two NAS, a NASA data set, which had been recently released in 2016, which was the night lights version of the sky. And this is a composited view. The clouds are gone. It's about, I don't know, 300 images stitched together. And it's often used to show a view of the connected world, you know, because there's so many lights, the world is connected as one big happy family. When I look at this image, the only thing I see are the gaps. Look at all those dark spaces, huge swaths of the world with no lights, no electricity. And started asking a question about what that meant. To ask the question about what it meant, we used a data set that is generated um, by Season, that is a, a lab up at in the Palisades, a Columbia, a Columbia University lab. And what they do is they collect censuses from all around the world and they put them together um, on a one kilometer by one kilometer grid so that you can click on any grid in the, in, in, on that map and you can see according to that census how many people live there, right? So this is very, again, very imperfect data set the census in the United States, for example, is much better counted than, uh, than the census in India, or at least released to the public in a form that is, that is, uh, that is counted. Um, but nevertheless, we, we still, you know, use this as a, as a guiding principle. And we looked for the gaps, right? So for the places in the world where there were lights and no people, and places in the world where there were people and no lights. And then we started, we, we um, through a, an algorithm um, that Will Geary wrote, and then we ended up with these 16,000 points, right? The yellow is lights and no people, blue is people, no lights. And then we started looking for categories, like how you could tell stories with 16,000 uh, points. And we figured out that for people and no lights. They were like wealthy enclaves, you know. In Colorado, they want a dark sky. They ask people to turn off their lights at night so that you can see the stars, right? But also refugee camps sometimes have no electricity. There was an outage in Aleppo. This was in uh, 2016. There was no electricity in Aleppo because of the war, right? Um, indigenous territories, that's, um, very complicated because some people think, oh, you need electricity in indigenous territories and other people say, no, leave them alone, right? So there's all these political um, uh, decisions that are built into, into this kind of thing. So, and then, you know, we showed the, the daylight view, right? And suddenly, you know, where there's no light, you can see there's urban development and tons of people, right? And this became our storytelling device. Um, what became more interesting were the places um, where there were lights and no people contiguous to places where there were people and no lights. And that, in fact, told the strongest, most powerful story. Um, and so we fixated on these six categories, um, industrial farms, power plants, a tourism site, um, ports, natural gas extraction sites, military bases, borders, and strip mines. Um, let's see. Oops. And I'm going to show you only one of these stories, which is in the Central uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's operated by Glencore, an Anglo-Swiss mining company. And you notice that there's a dam on the one side of the country and an open pit mine on the other side of the country. And what happens is that the government prioritizes a high voltage line which carries electricity from the dam to the, to the mine. 
and make sure it always has e electricity um, and that the cities and villages along the way are not even allowed to draw power from this line. And so if you live in this part of the Cameroon uh, of the DRC, you will, you will have very uneven electricity. Right, and then we, at, at the end of each thing, we showed that there were many, many sites like this in the world. In this case, these are part of 220 Glencore mines, um, which have very similar patterns in relation to where they are located and who the electricity benefits. In fact, one of my students um, in the conflict urbanism seminar last semester showed how this was true in Mozambique as well. where all electricity was sent to European countries rather than helping people in Mozambique. And I think that is my last slide. Thank you so much, Laura, for um, this amazing presentation. I am going to now make it possible for um, uh, participants to unmute themselves. So if someone wants to uh, ask the first question, you're welcome to do that. I will also read questions to Laura from the chat so that they um, exist in the, in the audio archive. Um, so uh, again, thank you for this amazing presentation. Obviously there are, are um, you know, we could speak for hours and hours and hours on, on yeah. visual studies <laughs> and all of the work <laughs> of BSR. Um, Anyone who, who would like to uh, break the ice and ask the first question? Um, that would mind. Go ahead, Christopher. Uh, one of the, uh, the question I have is about um, how you choose which, um, which area to, to research next, or like mm -hmm. what are the things that you're considering when you're picking something to really dive into? Yeah. Well, you know, because we're a, a mapping uh, center, right, we really focus on methods and um, rather like if I was a historian and I was doing, you know, modern history or, you know, uh, indigenous uh, culture, I would be an expert in that. Um, but because we do mapping and our approach is to have a critical um, lens on the data that we use and to tell stories about um, things that might not have been noticed. We often collaborate across disciplines um, and then we choose within that what we're interested in. We also often, you know, you could see Aleppo and now we're doing coronavirus. We often focus on current current events and then uncover the history, but very much um, choose collaborators and are chosen by collaborators. Um, so it's a, it's a very good question, but I think you can see that the underlying um, approach is that we approach mapping as a counter cartography and we really underscore the politics and the history associated with each particular method that we use and each particular topic that we address. So if that helps. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. often it's very common with a mapping a mapping center. Yeah. More questions. Um I have a question. Yeah. Um so I'm particularly interesting interested in the mapping historical New York City project that you're doing. And yeah, I was yeah. just wondering, like, because I know you briefly mentioned that um, 
it's also showing like history of whiteness and like white New yeah. York. And uh -huh. I was also wondering, like, when you do a project like this, do you kind of have like a thesis that you're formulating your argument around doing your research or does it just uh -huh. kind of accumulate into something? Yeah, well, this is, you know, this was a three year long project. Um, and, you know, May Nye is a, a historian of immigration, Rebecca Cobrin, um, researches deeply um, the history of, uh, of New York. Gergo Baich is, a, again, a methodologist of GIS and history. Um, and we applied for this grant because um, this hasn't been done before, right? So there's, there, there have been, there's been incredible work done before of digitizing old maps. And, but if you do, if you digitize it and create it into an actual GIS format, um, you could you could ask all kinds of analytical questions. And so we've only gotten to the stage where we've almost fully digitized Manhattan and Brooklyn over these three years. And Dan Miller in CSR has done huge amounts of work with a lot of students. This has, a lot of students have participated in this project. And Wright Kennedy is a uh, postdoc in the history department and we really have had tons and tons of students work on it. We are now ready to ask analytic questions. Um, so, you know, and we, we're, we're thinking of all kinds of ways, you know, what were the top 10 jobs in, uh, oh my God, it's thundering outside. What are the top 10 jobs, um, you know, in 1850 versus 1880 versus, you know, um, how many black people had come to New York, although the Great Migration was later in history. Are there invisible communities that weren't counted by the census? That's <clears throat> so we're asking, where were the most overcrowded? Actually, Leah Meisterlin and Gergo Beitsch <clears throat> showed <clears throat> that Manhattan was more crowded in the early, in the early, in the 1800s than it is now. Um, the other parts of New York now that were crowded, but the incredible overcrowding around, um, you know, factories and things like that, which were in the city was very intensive. Um, so there's all, so on the one hand, for that one, we are going to have a public facing uh, website and we're going to tell the public certain things about historical New York. But we're also making this amazing database available to historians to ask their own questions. And we have no idea what those questions will be, but we're, the, the goal is to make it public. That's incredible. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Laura. The next question is from uh, Lori. It was entered into the chat. She says, hi, yeah. Thank you for the wonderful talk. You mentioned your research on activating weak ties and reinforcing them in communities that are not homophilous. Can you please elaborate on some of the ways you're achieving these connections? Ah, okay. That is, that's a very good question. And, you know, we're, we're actually just finishing up that paper. And what we're trying to say, you know, we're not reinforcing them in communities that are not homophilous. We're trying to think about how to create conditions that are not homophilous. And that if our social networks were designed differently, if our cities had different policies, we might be able to achieve something different than, wh than when homophily is naturalized as an axiom of social life, which it was never ever defined as. So, um, you should, I, I can't answer the question, but there was a credible housing um, uh, uh, activist, Catherine Bauer, and there's a book that's recently been uh, re-released by her and her theories. You know, if social policy had listened to Catherine Bauer, we might have very different cities than we have today. Um, so, very different housing policies. But it's really, it's a project we don't, we do, you know, and we really actually want to work with computer scientists to try and figure out ways of activating weak ties. Um, that's part of our, that's going to be part of our ongoing work this year. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. I think we'll give um, the 
the guests in, in the chat just uh, maybe two more minutes to okay. have, have one, one additional question. Um, I think this one will be our last, so we can end mm -hmm. at an hour and 15 minutes. Um, okay. Susanna is wondering, um, where does all of the data come from? Of course, mm -hmm. apart from the Mormon New York census, is acquiring the right amount of data difficult for the center researchers? Yeah. Um, acquiring data is a major part of our research, right? So um, the million dollar blocks data, that's the hardest data to get. We've actually just requested more data from the, um, from the, from Albany, from where the prison uh, data is, is held and it's not publicly accessible data. We have scraped data from the web, you know, like the way we did the YouTube video that we had to, you know, figure out ingenious ways of doing that. And because we had these neighborhood names collated, we could do that. Um, the, we got access to the Columbia uh, database through Juan and connections he had in Columbia. The data that we had is a much finer grain than was given to the public, which is why we could do such amazing uh, work with it. Um, every project has um, a different, you know, some data is publicly available, but not mapped in the same way. So for example, the season gridded population of the world is just this amazing resource. If you go to their website, it just looks like a bunch of pixels, right? So we've animated it and we've worked with it in more creative ways through uh, software programs like processing or like D3, um, you know, so there's not only the data that's there, but it's thinking of the data um, as a storytelling device, as an analytic project um, in terms of, uh, you know, how to use it in the most responsible, in the most responsible and also innovative ways. So, you know, our lab grew up around the word data visualization for our first 10 years, we were called the Spatial Information Design Lab and we've transformed into the Center for Spatial Research and it's unknown yet what the future of it will be. Yeah. Actually, uh, Bahara has asked to um, ask one more question. So I'm not sure if you wanted to mute yourself or type it into the chat. Okay. Um, um, yeah, sure. I'm just going to mute it and I'm going to ask it here. Um, thank you so much, Lara, for the great presentation. Um, yeah. My question is about the first um, the Hemopolis um, project. Yeah. Uh -huh. Have there ever like been a study to show an algorithm result about if the pattern of the community that black and white people choose to live with, with each other like changes, how that impact them psychologically and like serving them in a way like to show their emotions and feelings and just finding an algorithm about um, instead of like having a natural, you know, um, homophilus, like if that pattern changes and they have to like live with each other. So how that impacts them in the psychology. Right. Um, I'm sure they are studies like that. I haven't, you know, cause we were looking at how it as a concept became naturalized and implemented in social networks. So that was our trajectory. Um, Wendy Chun has, she's been looking at the ambivalent uh, population answers, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't, uh, psychology is not my um, field. <laughs> um, I'm sure there are, if you, if you look up, if, if you look up, um, if you look it up. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's definitely a concept that has been studied. Um, yeah. Thank you again, Laura. And I just want to um, mention, you can find um, CSR at csr.columbia.edu um, online. Yeah. It's actually C4SR, C oh. the number. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry about that, C4SR. Um, you can yeah. add that into the chat, Laura. You can also find that yeah. on Instagram and on Twitter um, to, to see updates on, on what they're working on. Um, so I'll leave the group open for just a few more seconds, but thank you so much, Laura, for all of your work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And thanks everyone for coming and, uh, please email me, especially incoming students or anyone, if you have questions.